Good morning. It's great to see our participants, you know, logging in and viewing this webinar. My name is Steve Prophet, and my colleague here with me is Bill Banish, and we are special education consultants for the IDEA team at the State Education Resource Center. A little bit about um, this webinar is that we are going to work through a special tool using a special tool and a process with um, in how to design good, effective, strong standards-based IEPs. A little bit about our agency, the State Education Resource Center, is that we value ed equity, excellence, and education. We ensure that we continue to examine and promote equitable opportunities and practices for all students, specifically those of students of color, students with disabilities, English learners, and socioeconomically disadvantaged students. We also value strong professional learning opportunities for educators and stakeholders, such as designing this webinar to deliver to you. And lastly, we ensure that we want to ensure that we continue to support and implement, implement educational opportunities in schools and agencies for to, to provide good learning opportunities for students. We also hope that the content today that you receive in this webinar can prompt you to create a professional learning community within your school or district to engage school staff and leaders on how to create and develop strong IEPs that would lead to educational benefit for students with disabilities. If you want additional information about this content, um, please don't hesitate to contest, contact us um, at the, our contact information is located at the end of the PowerPoint that we're using during today's webinar. So let's begin. Education is all about access. Learning is dependent on accessing the standards and curriculum similar to entering a building through a door. So for a student with disabilities, access to the general education curriculum and the Common Core State Standards is critical to ensure learning. Hello, again, this is Bill Banish. And um, as we go through, we're going to talk a little bit about uh, why it's necessary to connect our goals and objectives with uh, state standards. Um, and then we're going to actually talk about the tool. We're going to work through it and go through each section for you. And then at the end, we'll spend a brief moment talking about how you can use the tool. Uh, so beginning, as Steve was saying, this is about accessing the general education curriculum. Um, this comes right out of IDEA, the Individuals with Disability Education Act. And right within the language, it says that students must be involved in and make progress within the general education curriculum. So the goal is, or the challenge is, to write IEPs that meet general education standards while providing specially designed instruction to meet the individual needs of a student. And that's how we create our IEPs. This is not an either or situation. All too often, IEPs are either specially designed instruction with no connection to general education, or they just restate the general education with little to no specially designed instruction. It is important to remember that an IEP is actually a meld of both of these concepts. So how do we align these? Well, the challenge becomes even more complex once a student with disability turns 16, of, 16 years of age or earlier. Now we're getting into also post-school outcome goals. So we want to make sure that we're also connecting and writing post-school outcome goals that are aligned with um, not only state standards, but also what are some of the post-school goals that the student needs to work on. So now this is a copy of the tool. Um, you should have, this should have been sent to you, so you should have a copy of this tool um, as we move forward. Um, so this tool is really designed to create IEP goals and objectives with a level of specificity. This tool was designed to facilitate a process that first examines the general education curriculum and setting demands, and then we use a gap analysis to determine the levels of support that will be needed for specially designed instruction. This tool provides us with a bank of words that represent both general education and specially designed instruction. This bank of words will then help us to write sentences that will become the IEP goals and objectives. 
So this multimedia training will provide instruction on the use of this tool, and we'll go through the tool one cell at a time. This is, some, this is um, an example of how you can use the word bank. When we do this in district and we go in and we talk to uh, teachers, we have them fold the page in half. And they start on just the general education side first. So we want them to just actually talk about the actual grade level of the student, no matter the student's disability, um, no matter where they are. We want to know what all students are doing. So what, are, what is expected of all students within this grade? And then we will get to the specially designed instruction part. So now let's take a look at the first part of this process. So the first major tenet of the process is establishing the general education curriculum and setting those demands. So now we sh you should be on the left side of the tool. So the law is requiring us to develop specially designed instruction that will allow students to participate and progress in the general education curriculum, regardless of the severity of the gaps or of the student or their disability. This tool can help you figure out how to bridge those gaps, but, at but first we need to determine the ultimate goal for all students. Therefore, we need to work from the age appropriate standards or the curriculum that the student is enrolled in. You can notice at the top of the tool that there is a space is included for to target those post-school outcomes and occupational career standards to support the transition planning for our older students. So the Common Core State Standards are the starting point for which school teams need to determine where we want to begin the process as to what kinds of supports and specially designed instruction students will need to meet the age appropriate grade level standards. Okay, so moving on with, with the tool, um, I just wanted to make a quick note about the occupational standards. You can find those standards on ONET that is a Department of Labor website, which has a lot of the um, occupational standards that are out there so that we can make sure for our transition age students, again, these are students in their 15th year going into their 16th year, uh, we want to make sure that we find out what they want to do and we put those standards in as well. So now moving on to the um, left side, we're still on the general education piece. Uh, now we want to focus on knowledge, and understanding and skills in the left-hand column labeled general education curriculum and setting demands. Standards can be written with a laundry list of knowledge, understandings, and skills in a single sentence. It is easier to narrow the essential learning when that sentence can be taken apart and the specific concepts and skills are isolated. Along the same line, making standards work articulates a method for unwrapping a standard and isolating the concepts and skills within that standard. For this process, we will use that method. So, a tip for unwrapping standards. After you select the grade level standard for the student, you want to circle the verbs or verb phrases. These are the skills that the student needs to be able to do. Then you want to underline the nouns or noun phrases, these are the concepts, these are what the student needs to know. And then you want to square the modifiers, which will describe how the students will do this. And again, we are on the, we are on the general education side. A great way to unwrap standards, too, for the, for the participants who are special education teachers, is to work with your general education colleagues, if you have them within your school, because they are very familiar with unwrapping standards and finding out what the essential piece is within that. As special educators, you might need to actually go deeper to uh, look at what are those essential skills that a student needs. Um, this is a great activity to do in your professional learning community. So when you have a professional learning community, make sure that you have general and special education together. So now we're going to look at assessments and benchmarks. We're going to focus on that 
cell labeled assessments and benchmarks in the left hand column. This section specifically refers to the assessment process and targeted benchmarks, benchmarks used in general education for all students. In other words, this will determine the level of mastery or performance expectations of these standards that are expected for all students. Again, we cannot figure out what the gap is for our, for our student unless we know what is expected of all students. That's why we're spending a lot of time on the general education piece at first. So we want to look at to what degree will the concept or skill be demonstrated. We want to look at the accuracy and the frequency of that. And how will we know it was performed to that degree? So to determine whether the student has mastered the general education curriculum standard, specific criteria for measurement should be set. This allows for close monitoring of student growth, learning, and growth. Some good questions to ask are the ones that are on the screen. Benchmarks or performance expectations can be isolated in many places. They may exist in the general education curriculum, or they may be established by the local district through the use of common assessments, or you may need to refer to state assessments. In some cases, benchmarks may not have been established in general education. This would lend itself to some further conversation with colleagues. So again, this is another topic that you can work on with your professional learning community. It would be important to have shared meaning among teachers who teach the same standards as to how do we know when a student has mastered that concept. Now, as we're working on through the bank, we're going to get to methods for instruction. This section will define the instructional and environmental demands that go into teaching these standards. Some standards actually list methods for instruction. So you may want to review the standard to locate any information related to instructional delivery. Now we'll get into a little bit more about methods for instruction. So when you look at methods for instruction, this is not an exhaustive list by any means, but these are some things that we want to look for. What are the instructional methods for the standard? What are the environmental situations, social interactions, the prerequisite skills and knowledge that students need, and the demonstration of learning? We're going to go through these each in a little more detail. So when it comes to instructional methods, we have differentiated instruction, visual, auditory, kinesthetic, is it lecture? Is it more hands-on? Um, and the physical demands. When it comes to demonstration of learning, these are some of the methods. Um, but the methods of instruction, they would need to include how is the learning assessed and how students demonstrate their learning, both formally and informally. It would include teacher observations, presentations, homework, paper and pencil tests, projects, etc. We also have to look at environmental conditions. So these are the actual ways that both physical space and the climate of the classroom are organized. It can be as simple as where to write your name on a piece of paper or the arrangement of the furniture in the room. It would also include things that relate to sensory demands as well, such as noise level. It is important to note the kinds of routines and transitions that would be part of the instructional flow. And you might have been wondering about social interactions. This is really about methods for instruction which include that. And it's related to how students are grouped, how adults interact with students within the lesson, and the types of behavioral expectations that are established for the students. And again, this is for all students now. We're still talking about that general education side. And the last piece for the general education side is now we want to focus on what are some of the materials. So this section will define the types of materials used to teach the standard. Some standards actually list materials for instruction. So you may want to review the standard to locate any information related to instructional delivery. So let's go through some of these in a little more detail. 
Some materials for instruction could be manipulatives, technology, paper and pencil, or text. So how, what materials are we actually using within the classroom? And that's important for as we get into our next piece when we talk about um, our gaps and our barriers and our bridges. Because for instance, uh, when we talk about the materials for instruction, if it's expected that the student's supposed to use a textbook in a classroom, and we have a student with a severe reading disability, then that textbook will become a barrier for the student. So we have to know if that textbook is, a, is an essential piece of how that instruction is going to be done. And if that is the case, this is where the specially designed instruction will come in. So that's why, again, just to end it on the general education side, it is important for us to know what is expected of all students so that we can find what those gaps are and then we can design our specially designed instruction. Again, keeping in mind that we want our students to get as much of the general education as possible and that they make progress with as much of the general education as possible. So we have just completed the first part of the three-part process, establishing the general education targets and setting demands. And we hope that the points discussed here will lead to effective focused conversation within your PLCs. We hope that you know, this will also promote a thinking process for, on the part of your staff, on your part of your teams and staff members when it comes to examining general education, curriculum, and standards. Let's begin to examine now the present levels of performance, which is a critical component of the IEP. So we now need to determine what the specially designed instruction will look like to support a student to meet these standards. So in looking at your tool, we'll now be focusing on the middle section, ex examining bridges, gaps, and barriers. So these columns will now help define what areas addressed under the general education curriculum and setting demands require specially designed instruction and what areas can remain as a typical instruction in the general education environment. So we now want to determine the gap analysis which compares the relationship between curricular and setting demands of the general education to the unique needs of each individual child. So now, again, within a PLC, strong conversation about bridges, gaps, barriers, and the whole gap analysis concept that our students with disabilities face in the general education environment can be generated. So now, we should be on analyst. So the purpose of the gap analysis is to determine what areas a student can do or learn with no additional supports, and which areas will require changes to support their learning. It will sometime come with a bridge ready to cross over for learning. Therefore, no changes to the instructional or environmental design is required. However, other times, the student does not come with a bridge and a gap exists. Therefore, we need to build a bridge for that student or make changes to the instruction or environmental conditions. This process takes this concept and defines the analysis as looking for bridges and gaps. What is a bridge? A bridge is anything that does not require any change to the general education curriculum or setting them. So in other words, the student can successfully learn or achieve the general education standard in the way the general education instruction is currently designed. A gap is typically a set of missing critical skills or knowledge that is necessary to achieve the general education standard. These may include skills or knowledge that is not taught, no longer taught, or requires more intensity of teaching in order for the student to obtain those skills or knowledge. So what is a barrier? So in looking at this definition, we need to identify ways for the student to access the curriculum, 
instruction, and or environment. So here's another example within your PLC where you can also begin to study universal design for learning principles that will assist teachers and teams with providing opportunities for students to have greater access in classrooms by removing barriers. We have an example here of, of a, a, a student with disabilities. So if you take a look at this example, you'll see the present levels of performance. And it's important to isolate the specific ways in which a piece of the standard or instruction is a bridge or a gap or a barrier. So in some cases, there may be pieces of an item that is a bridge, while pieces of the same item that is a gap and a barrier. The trick here is to go line by line, item by item, down the list until you completed each one. This method will ensure that you are able to discern in what ways something is a bridge, gap, or barrier, and not to make assumptions about a student's knowledge or skills. So now we will move on to um, the next piece of the uh, tool, which is uh, we're now going to look at what are at we've done parts one and two. So now we're going to focus on establishing um, the general education curriculum and setting and demands. We've done that. We've done the gap analysis project uh, process and we've determined the students bridges, gaps and barriers. So now we're going to move on to the next section of the tool. And in the next section of the tool, now we are going to focus on the actual specially designed instruction. So again, if you're a general education teacher uh, listening to this webinar at this point, you would want to have uh, your special education teachers involved in your um, learning communities because they can actually really help. This is what they do every day. They can help to specially design that instruction. So if you're going to, again, have a professional learning community, to have general and special educators together, this is, that they'll work really well with this tool. So now we're going to look at um, supplemental instruction, accommodations, and modifications. I think it's important first to talk about some decision-making principles. And that is that when we want to write our IEPs, we only want them to be as specialized as necessary. Uh, in my former role as a transition coordinator uh, within a high school, um, I know that when uh, modifications are needed, they're needed for some of our students. But I also know that modifications do not exist in post-secondary life. They're very few and far between. Uh, colleges do not offer modifications for students. They will not change um, actually what the students uh, have to do compared to other students. There are some accommodations available and we will go through the difference between those uh, shortly. But we really want to start only as specialized as necessary with each student. That's why we want to start with general education first. That's our first option to see how much of the general education we can actually do with our students. So in other words, we don't want to have a student who might have a disability and say we have a program for this disability and the student automatically goes there based on their disability. We want to make sure we look at each student in isolation to see how much of that general education piece they can get. Then we want to provide those additional supports only as needed to provide that access and to make progress. So just getting back to the term, the term special education means specially designed instruction. It should be at no cost to parents. It should meet the unique needs of a child with a disability. Again, this is in the Individuals with Disability Education Act, which it really means that special education is about a type of instruction. It's not really a place or a program. So when we talk about uh, level of support, we want to first go to general education as designed for all students. That's where we want to start with our levels of support. So we don't want to jump straight to modifications or accommodations. We want to first go to general education as designed. Um, we might be able to accomplish this also with assistive technology 
or like Steve said, if we embedded some universal design for learning principles early on in the curriculum, any way that we can get students to use general education as designed is the best place to start. After that, we might need to have some supplemental instruction. So in other words, the student would still be in the general education class, and then they might need to go to a resource room to have some supplemental instruction done, but they still haven't missed out on the rigor and the enrichment of that general education classroom. Then we work to accommodations. So again, what's maybe some assistive technology we can use with the student? What are some other accommodations we can use with the student without changing the actual amount of work that they have to do compared to other students. And then lastly, um, of course, modifications will always have their place. These are individual educational plans, but when we get to modifications, that should be the bottom of the list. That's where we go when we cannot meet the student's needs through general education as designed, supplemental instruction, or accommodations. So if a student does receive modifications, we just want to be aware that once they do that, they are not meeting what other students are meeting in terms of what they need to graduate. So we'll get into these in a little more detail. So when we get into supplemental instruction, um, we might need some additional instruction. It might be needed to support missing skills, concepts. It is instruction on the skills, concepts, and strategies that are not typically taught no longer taught, or go beyond the general education. For example, phonic skills for a high school student, study skills for a fifth grader, copying strategies for dealing with anxiety for a first grader. Before we move to accommodations or modifications, supplemental instruction should be considered first. This instruction can support a need and potentially close a gap without the need of providing any further support. It is important to note that this instruction is provided beyond the core general education instruction, not instead of the general education instruction. Therefore, it's supplemental. When we look at accommodations, just to um, get back to what an accommodation is, an accommodation is a change made to the instruction or assessment pro procedures to provide a student with full access to learning but we're not changing the content or the performance expectations for meeting that standard. So it's really about the how the instruction is being provided. When we talk about modifications, modification is a change in the skills, the concepts, or the performance expectations. That's the what, what the student is doing. While it may be modified, the topic and the content remains the same. So something else to seriously consider. Curriculum modifications decrease the chance of a student meeting with success in state assessments. In the age of the Elementary and Secondary Education Act, we need to take the use of modifications very seriously. It should be a last resort after considering multiple accommodations. It is also important, which I talked about earlier, that if a student has a goal of attending colleges, colleges do not modify curriculum. Therefore, if we continue to modify curriculum for the student, we will be setting them up for a very difficult um, post-secondary um, education future. So whenever we use modifications, we need to continuously monitor student progress and have conversations as to how we will move from the modification back to the full content and performance expectations in general education. Modifications that can be used carelessly can result in greater academic achievement gaps. Modifications used strategically will provide learning support towards closing those achievement gaps. The most effective way to plan for such modifications is to examine the level of rigor within a standard. So as Bill mentioned, this is also another very important topic, the whole conversation about accommodations and modifications that can be studied and discussed within a PLC. We need, we need to ensure that all teachers have a clear understanding of what constitutes an accommodation 
and what constitutes a modification and to really ensure that they have a solid understanding of that. So something to seriously consider, we need to just keep these points at the forefront of our discussions at PPTs when designing IEPs that will lead to educational benefit. We want to ensure that we're starting with age appropriate grade level standards and curriculum, that we're examining those essential content and skills that students need to ensure that they are career and college ready, and that we're working diligently to ensure that students are having access to the same level of rigor. The revised Bloom's Taxonomy and Webb's Depth of Knowledge are good tools and good resources to use when determining rigor for students. And the ultimate goal is how do we work as teams to close the achievement gaps. So in, in examining these guiding rules, decisions should be made with the least dangerous assumptions in mind. As Ann Donlan states, in the absence of absolute evidence, it is essential to make the assumption that, if proven to be false, would be least harmful to the individual. So I'd just like to add another piece on the least dangerous assumption, which is the third bullet point down. The least dangerous assumption means that if we're not really sure if a student is able to do, let's say, some general education curriculum, what would be the more dangerous assumption? That they cannot do the general education? In other words, if we make that assumption, then we might not ever allow access for that student to the general education curriculum. Or would the least dangerous assumption be that the student is allowed to try and to move forward and to push beyond what we believe they'll be able to do? Um, as a former special education teacher, I was always pleasantly surprised by how far my students would go and how far they would reach beyond even my expectations. So having that least dangerous assumption as part of how we look at our students is a really important piece. Um, so we want to make sure that as we're, as we're thinking about our students and as we're writing our plans, that in the absence of that absolute evidence that they cannot do something, we need to make that least dangerous assumption and give them the chance to make, make access and participate within the general education curriculum. So, so in closing, as Bill mentioned, and we hopefully accomplished throughout this webinar, it's critical that staff have a common understanding of these principles on this slide so that strong, effective, standards-based IEPs can be developed to lead students to be career and college ready and have educational benefit for those students. Your PLCs can help team members develop this common lens and understanding through good, focused, targeted dialogue. Now, what we'd like to do is we'd like to take a five-minute break. Um, we're going to go over some of your questions. We see that there's quite a few here, and we just want to make sure that uh, we try to answer all of them before the end of the hour. So please give us five minutes, and we will be right back if you'd like to hear the answer to the questions. Thank you again for viewing this webinar. And as Bill mentioned, our contact information is at the end of this PowerPoint. So we hope that you continue to email us and for any additional information. One of the questions that was asked was reference to the least dangerous assumption principle cited by Ann Donnellan. If you Google Ann Donnellan and type in Google least dangerous assumption, you'll get a good overview of that principle that will help you for your understanding and help you guide your thoughts with regards to ensuring that your IEPs are as rigorous as possible. Another question came in regarding the modifications for highly, for highly gifted students, specifically those students whose disability has to do more with social <coughs> pragmatics. Although not required, it is best practice to really modify curriculum for those that level of students, those students who are real who are talented and gifted, and to ensure that their specific learning needs are met. So taking a look at um, really enriching the, the content for those students so they are um, so that their needs continue to, and they continue to be challenged to learn to the maximum extent that they can as well. We had a few questions um, about the uh, this webinar and if it will be archived. It will be. 
Um, so the full webinar will be posted within a week. All right, and then um, we also received another uh, question, um, which was, this was about, um, you know, where, where can we find um, more information on goal writing and other pieces and how can we use this within our state? So will this be applicable? I know we do have some people from around the country and welcome. Connecticut loves to hear from all of you. Um, I will say that um, a lot of what we're talking about comes out of IDEA. So this is federal. This does go around the uh, country. But this is really... Um, more about setting up a, pro a professional learning community, and you should be able to use this tool. This tool translates very well with IDEA, and it will work really in any state and how you use it. You might have to modify or you might do some things different as you go along. But you should see, I know that Connecticut has IEP manuals, which talk about all the pieces and how to write and connect IEPs. Uh, you might have to uh, consult with your state's IEP manuals that are usually located on your State Department of Education uh, websites. And there was a question asked about an IEP rubric and a transition IEP rubric. We have those available on our school sites and on our um, CERC website. So you may want to take a look at the IEP rubric as well as the transition rubric when you, as you begin to develop your standards-based IEPs to take a look at what are some of those promising practices that are, we have within the rubric to ensure that the IEPs are well written and well crafted for students educational benefit? Yes. And right now that is it. Uh, we will stay online for another five minutes just to see if any other questions come in. But at this point, I believe we have answered all questions. If we have not, we will go through and answer them. Um, in a couple more minutes as we see if any more come in. But for those of you who have joined us, thank you so much. We really uh, appreciate you tuning in. Um, again, our information, I will put it back up at the end of the PowerPoint. And that has our email. Again, I'm Bill Banish, and I am an IDEA consultant here at CERC, as well as Steve Prophet, who is an IDEA consultant here at CERC. It has our phone number, our extension, and it also has our email. Um, we will take them and we will try to answer your questions as well if we did not get to any of those today. All right, there's no more questions coming in. Enjoy the rest of the day and thank you so much for joining us this lovely morning here in Connecticut at CERC. Thank you.